Angela Chang, uh, the Asia, also the Asia Global Institute Senior Panel, uh, but as well as uh, Associate Professor of the Law School here at Hong Kong University, and Director of the Philip Wong Center for Chinese Law, uh, to talk about uh, her new book, uh, which is called High Wire. <coughs> okay, so let me uh, do a sales speech for her. Uh, it's a wonderful book, 300 pages. I just did a count over a thousand photos. It's a very serious book about how the Chinese government regulates uh, technology uh, as well as tech firms. Uh, and you know, there are general lessons uh, for us to think about you know, what is the future of AI in China uh, and how other countries are doing uh, as compared to China. Uh, so uh, Angela has been given a lot of talks around the world uh, in the last month. Uh, she just spent three weeks in the United States giving talks at Harvard, Stanford, uh, Columbia uh, University and many other places. Um, in the U.S., uh, obviously a lot of people are excited about you know, how uh, you know, China is doing, uh, you know, what the Chinese government is doing, uh, in regulating tech, um, regulating uh, the new economy. Um, and today, uh, she's going to give, give a slightly different talk because you know, I encourage her to think more globally because we are Asia Global Institute. Um, she's going to do a comparative analysis between the U.S., Europe, and China. Uh, you know, highlights the similarities and differences about how different um, jurisdictions regulate um, technologies, um, uh, including AI. Um, and I hope that you know, after you know the 40 minutes presentation given by her, uh, there will be a very dynamic um, discussion about you know what is the future of AI. Uh, and you can obviously ask her about you know her view on China as well. Uh, without further ado, Angela, please. What? <laughs> Okay, um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I feel so honored to um, present my second book uh, at the AGI, um, also as a, a senior um, fellow. Or should I call myself senior fellow? Yeah, so. Um, yes, 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 yes. No, it doesn't work. Okay, uh, this one doesn't seem to work. Oh, was it open? Now it works. Okay. That's fine. It, it happens all the time. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. So in today's talk, I will start by uh, giving you an overview of the global regulatory landscape, um, focusing on the three major jurisdictions, the United States, EU, and China. And then I will talk about, you know, how law can poten uh, potentially work as a competitive strategy for countries, as well as um, the potential problems arising from this strategy. Um, this is uh, the latest uh, statistics from Stanford uh, 2024 report on AI. And then you see, you know, governments seems to be in a race, you know, globally to regulate this transformative technology, right? Even though there's a slight dip very recently, but you know, it's actually the trend is still increasing, right? You see uh, government continue to promulgate a lot of AI laws. But before I start, I want to clarify when we talk about AI law, what are we talking about, right? I mean, so here I highlight, you know, there's traditional law, AI specific law, AI related law, and actually they can all be AI laws, right? I mean, so when when we think about AI law, it's not just the EU AI Act of the Chinese Generative AI uh, Regulations uh, that could be counted as AI law. Because AI services touch upon a wide variety of our daily activities. You are subject to a lot of pre-existing traditional law. Just think about copyright law, which had huge implications for AI services, right? I mean, so, um, and in fact, so when we think about the regulatory landscape, we need to bear in mind the AI law actually have a very broad scope and much bigger than the so-called AI specific law, AI related law that you have in mind, okay? So let's start with the United States being the global superpower in AI technology. Um, and um, when people think about AI regulation in the United States, the first thing they come ahead is, um, you know, those executive order. Um, the U.S. government have, um, the Biden administration have introduced, and particularly the executive order it introduced in October last year. It's a very sweeping, very long uh, executive order. I still remember at that time I was teaching at MIU, and then everyone was so excited about this executive order. 
But um, to be frank, when you look at it very closely, it's largely performative because for the most part, it's only subjecting firms of the most advanced AI capability to some transparency um, disclosure requirement and some monitor, uh, like uh, some reporting requirements of the dealings with foreign, uh, uh, foreign customers. And so there's actually quite minimal obligations on firms that they could impose. But you can also understand why, because you know, even if the Biden administration wants to do more, but it has very limited ability of doing that. And in fact, the law itself is already very controversial because they rely on a defense act dating back to the Korean War time in order to push through this regulation. And then a lot of contra legal controversy regarding, you know, can the president really leverage and, you know, a defense act um, to, uh, to uh, impose uh, regulatory burdens on firms? So, um, so in the US, I think the Biden administration did what it could do, you know, but it's still very minimal, I mean, actually. And, um, and so far, it seems quite unlikely that the US will introduce a comprehensive set of regulations to regulate AI technology, right? Despite you see this uh, sweeping executive order. And in the meantime, you see a lot of the US firms, they are racing to, uh, to uh, comply with, to pr propose voluntary commitments. Right, I mean, uh, at the beginning, I think there were seven companies, the leading AI companies, and recently there was another eight companies. So now we have 15 companies that offer this voluntary, voluntary commitments to, to do red teaming, safety tests, and, and you know, commit to more transparency requirements, and uh, data, um, by, uh, da da data compliance, etc. But it's voluntary, okay? It's not really subject to, uh, any form of, uh, you know, public oversight, okay? Um, and um, there's a lot of criticisms mm. of, you know, how little the U.S. government has done, but I, let, let us give a little bit, cre little bit credit to the Federal Trade Commission, right? I mean, in the past year, they have opened two investigations. The first investigation um, was uh, targeted at OpenAI, and um, they sent OpenAI 20 page documents um, um, trying to uh, figure out whether this firm have uh, you know, uh, 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 properly complied with data uh, regulations. And, um, and recently they started to poke into the potential antitrust issues because you see you know, all these firms, um, they have um, like Microsoft, like Google, like, they have invested in the leading AI firms uh, with minor minority interests, right? And then, um, and then now there's a growing suspicion that this could lead to uh, antitrust problems. Um, at the state level, uh, the U.S. has a, ha, you know, it's it's a big country, and then there's a lot of, you know, state legislations uh, that are uh, you see mushrooming, but they're mostly targeted at algorithmic harm. Okay, so they're only specifically dealing with particular type of AI uh, problems. And um, the state of California, um, you know, even in New York, when I was teaching, um, there was some uh, employment uh, discrimination laws that the, uh, the New York City was trying to uh, deal with. So if we think about the US, it looked like, you know, so far it's very light touch and it's a very friendly environment. However, the U.S. legal system is highly decentralized, okay? So that's why the U.S. has so many lawyers, and these people bring lawsuits. And um, so because of the very strong, we call it plaintiff's bar in the U.S., you see you know, the proliferation of private litigation in the United States. And in, just with copyright, there are 20 uh, copyright class action lawsuits uh, pending in front of the U.S. court. And the most famous one, you, you probably have all heard, is the New York Times lawsuit against OpenAI and Microsoft. Now they're seeking billions of dollars for, um, uh, from these firms for, uh, uh, for infringing um, their, um, uh, their, their copyright rights materials to use to train the AI models. Um, and, and not just copyright. Now, there's also class action lawsuits on data privacy violation, on employment discriminations, right? The list goes on. 
And you know, people will say, look, I mean, these cases are going nowhere. Um, it takes a long time. By the time they reach the Supreme Court, you know, these cases have been moot, right? I mean, the firms already profited. Um, well, when you look at the, what is happening at the moment, they are having an, an impact on firms' business revenue model. Right? I mean, OpenAI now has started to pay for content. Right? I mean, currently there are more and more uh, negotiations going on between media outlets and firms. Right? So they're changing firms' business model because all these litigations, even though they haven't reached you know, a decision or none of the firm has prevailed yet, but nonetheless it's putting pressure on the firm because you need to spend money on defending your case. Right? I mean, it, lawyers are expensive. Um, so, you know, so I wouldn't jump to the conclu conclusion and said that U.S. is just the wild west, the firms can do whatever they want because of the fact that they have a very strong plane to spar. Now what about the European Union? You heard a lot of buzz word about the EU AI Act, there's a lot of buzz about the EU AI Act because um, in the past couple of years the EU has been trying very hard um, to come up with the first comprehensive modern AI legislation, they, they, the efforts actually date back to 2018, um, and um, they're very close to the finishing line. Okay, so um, just last month, um, the European uh, Parliament adopted the finalized version, and so this law is expected to be implemented uh, later this year. And um, it is based on, uh, the, the, the law was structured on, on a risk-based approach. And in fact, when they were drafting the law a couple of years earlier, they didn't anticipate ChatGPT, right? So the specific provisions related to uh, generative AI um, actually were incorporated, only incorporated until like a couple, uh, like last year, uh, in about a year ago. Right? I mean, and there's a huge debate after the emergence of G GPT, how we should regulate GPT because it seems very different from other types of AI services that they have in mind. And so um, I woke up this morning with a headache. You know, I came back from the US, I have jet lag, but I'm usually okay in the morning. Uh, but, this, but this morning I had a headache because I think I'm, I, I need to talk about EU law. <laughs> and, when you look at the, the Parliament's version, um, it has over 430 something page, um, 113 provisions plus 13 annexes. So I was like, oh my God, I have to sift through all the entire legislation and to tell you what it is, right? I mean, so, um, and, and by the way, um, even if you ask people in Europe how they're going to implement this thing, um, they tell you, I don't know. Um, and so, th so this whole process um, of legislation, and, and you can understand where EU is coming from, because EU um, prides themselves as a super regulator, right? I mean, they want to be an innovator in legislation, in regulations, and that's why they work really hard to try to get the first comprehensive AI rules. But as to how, uh, whether these rules make sense, you know, uh, whether there's unintended consequences, how do we properly implement it? We have to wait and see, right? I mean, and, and, but the whole, the whole saga, the whole drama really looks like, the dynamics really looks like the, the enforcement of the general data protection law, the GDPR, a few years ago, right? And then to this day, it's been highly controversial about the impact of the GDPR because uh, there's a lot of empirical studies showing that it's actually holding back uh, the <laughs> actually holding back the small, small, medium-sized firms in terms of when they compete uh, w with the big arrivals and imposing a lot of the unnecessary regulatory burdens. It's not really helping and really offering a lot of protection to consumers. And, um, and so we will have to wait and see. And, and, and the good thing about EU law is that it's not like it will kick in immediately. You know, they do give a grace period for it, you know, grow, gradually rolled out to apply um, to uh, other services. Um, another thing about EU law is that for the most part, it is a self-regulation process. So firms don't need to obtain a license from the authority before they need to, before they introduce service to the public. Rather, it's through a self-assessment process. And that will mean that despite the fact that we have 450 page, like, uh, like over 400 page law, it's still 
you know, nothing compared with the actual implementation process because when you implement this thing, you still need to get certification from third parties and they have different, you know, all the standard setting bodies, you know, they have different uh, requirements, right? So the, the actual requirements is way more than those 430 pages. These only set out the guidelines, very general principles. When it comes to actual implementation, it's still subject to, uh, you know, third party certification. Now the big question is, Who's going to certify it? Who's qualified to certify it? And how do we monitor and ensure that those parties offering certification services do, you know, exactly what they should do, right? I mean, so that's why, you know, there's a big question mark in terms of the actual implementation of the, um, uh, uh, of the EU AI Act and how, you know, how, well, what kind of, um, what about its effectiveness as well. By the way, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, the center I'm running, the Center uh, for Chinese Law, uh, we will host um, an event on Friday. Um, and we invited, actually, one of the, the legislators uh, from the EU um, who's uh, in charge of drafting the EU AI Act uh, to come to talk to us uh, about, about this and, and, and how it might affect the Chinese legislation as well, I mean, because there's so many question marks about this and we are keen to hear the debate. But another dynamic of the EU AI Act that I want to highlight is that actually, despite that it's so burdensome and cumbersome already, it's actually better, way better. Well, I wouldn't say better, okay. It's actually um, imposed a lighter burden than the previous version we saw that was adopted by the, by the parliament um, in, uh, in June last year. So the, so the version that we had in March is actually, you know, had already been watered down quite significantly after very strong lobbying from uh, the Ger Germany and France. I mean, you may recall, you know, a couple of months ago, um, a, a French president, Emmanuel Macron, was saying that, look, I mean, EU, when they have this AI Act, will become a leader in AI regulation, but we won't be a leader in AI, right? Because we impose all these unnecessary burdens on our firms. And so, um, so they actually remove a lot of the stringent requirements for AI systems. And um, it, it in fact, you know, only subject, um, you know, for, for instance, in, in terms of generative AI, you know, only the, those firms with very high, uh, with systematic risk will be subject to very stringent requirements. Those with high risk, um, they, they will be subject to a lot of the transparency uh, requirements, disclosure requirements, but they don't need to go through a lot of conformative tests, okay? Oh, before that, I, let me go back here. But this is only a tip of the iceberg. Remember the slides I show you at the very beginning. When we think about AI regulation, we shouldn't just think about those AI-specific law, right? EU already have a long list of toolkits to deal with AI services. They have the GDPR, which means serious businesses, and they have been aggressively implemented it. If you think about it, OpenAI is now investigated in by almost every single national data authority in Europe, okay? And, and then um, at the Italian authority even suspended uh, OpenAI service, you know, when, when, uh, back in April last year, right, temporarily, and recently fined the firm, right? And um, French authority recently imposed a very big fine on Google for uh, violating the, the train, uh, for train, for the training data violation, for, for violating copyright, okay? That, well, I, I haven't seen other government authority did that. Um, and EU introduced a long list of rules specifically targeted at big tech firms, like particularly the Digital Markets Act and Digital uh, Services Act. These two very important milestone regulation that was introduced and become effective um, last year and they will have application, direct applications to all these major uh, AI firms uh, that are offering those services, right? I mean, so suffice to say, EU is very tough with um, regulation. They're very committed. And I know these people who are sitting in Brussels do nothing but thinking about regulation every day. You know, th these are the policy entrepreneurs really dedicated to regulation. And I expect that they will take their job very seriously. And um, if you look around the world, you know, where will it be a jurisdiction that will seriously regulate this technology? I would think of the EU. Because this is not a country. This is a supranational 
organization specifically dedicated to you know, specific mission of achieving a single, single uh, market for the EU, right? I mean, so, so it's, it's not a country, because if it is a country, it will think, need to think about economic consequences, it need to think about national competitiveness, it need to think about a lot of other things. But as an EU organization, their target is more how I strengthen my regulatory control, how I achieve a single market, right? I mean, so, um, so the people's mindset, the people working at the EU institution are very different, right? They're very, very committed to regulation and they take their job very seriously, okay? And then we have China, right? So if we look at the China's regulatory landscape in AI, we have the impression that China is a pioneer, okay? In 2021, China introduced the first comprehensive measures to regulate a recommendation algorithm, okay? Even was ahead of the EU. Um, a year later, China introduced rules to regulate defake. Also, China was the first jurisdiction to regulate defake. And when GPT emerged, two <coughs> months after it emerged, China already banned a lot of the GPT-like services from app, app, Apple's App Store. And within six months, this um, GPT much, China already introduced a compre comprehensive draft measures to regulate generative AI, okay? And in August last year, China finalized um, its draft rules uh, on, generative, uh, on management of generative AI services, making China the first country in the world to have a comprehensive um, measures to regulate generative AI. So China actually was ahead of the EU in having um, a, a formal law to deal with um, this transformative technology. And by the way, unlike the US, unlike the EU, China is the first jurisdiction, and I think it's the only jurisdiction so far, that have introduced a licensing regime, okay? So before you introduce chat like services to the public, you will need to obtain regulatory approval from the Cyberspace Administration of China before you do that, right? You don't see that in the United States, Right? OpenAI don't need to do that. You don't even see that in Europe being such a strict authority, right? But China has that. And then that gives the impression that, look, I mean, China is very strict, and China want, has the regulatory ambition to be uh, you know, an AI regulatory governance pioneer. And by the way, all this strict regulation will hold back China's uh, you know, AI development. So in today's talk, I'm going to challenge this perception and trying to bring more nuances um, uh, to, to the table um, and by introducing my book, okay? <laughs> so this book was released uh, last month and, um, and it's, it's a big book. Um, it has over 432 pages, not as long as the EU law, yeah, but the print is very big, okay? So mine is much smaller. I definitely, it's, it, mine is have 150,000, over 150,000 words. Um, so it have 11 chapters. And it mostly deals with platform regulation, how the government regulate platform in different areas of law, antitrust, data, labor, as well as how platform themselves adapt to government regulation by self-regulating. Because if you think about it, platforms are actually really important regulators. They are the major regulator dealing with disputes arising from the platform. So I have a specific, or I have specifically devoted two chapters to deal with the internal self-regulation by platforms. Um, but beyond that, um, I also look ahead and see, you know, how do we predict the future of China's platform regulation by comparing what China is doing with EU and the United States. And in the last chapter, I talk about China's regulation of generative AI, which is the main topic for today. But I think the most important contribution of the book is in part one, the first three chapters plus the introduction it's actually, so you can see it as a four chapters, that I talk, introduce an analytical framework for us to think more generally how China regulates its tech, you know, tech sector. And in fact, this model is so universally applicable that I also applied it to other settings, particularly some of the biggest policy challenges that China has faced in recent years. So let me briefly mention this analytical framework. Um, I am, um, so if we think about regulation as a system, okay, this is a highly complex system uh, consisting 
of three major components. We have the regulatory structure, we have the regulatory process, and then we have the regulatory outcome. Now, I use three key words to describe China's regulatory system. First, the regulatory structure is very hierarchical because it involves players from different tiers of the Chinese society. We have at the apex, you have the Chinese top policymaker, the top leadership, right, who are in charge of formulating the policy, and then we and then we have the regulators, and then we have the firms and the general public. So they're situated in a very hierarchical manner, right? And um, one distinct um, feature of this regulatory uh, regulatory structure is that you see because it's very hierarchical, so regulators will have to respond very closely to the top, right? Because they are held in the upward accountability mechanism. And um, so that actually results in a paradoxical phenomenon that they either do very little or do too, do too much, okay? Why do they do very little? Is when the top policy initiatives or signals is not very clear or what they're supposed to do actually could be deemed in contravention with the top signal, then they would do very little, right? They were they on the side of caution. But when the top send out a very strong policy signal, then they would try to do a lot, right? Because they want to demonstrate the loyalty to the top. And in fact, if they don't do a lot, they might lose their turf as other agencies very aggressively trying to expand their territory, right? So this is not just an aggressive strategy, it's also a defensive strategy that they need to do a lot. So that results in a paradoxical phenomenon that, you know, you see the Chinese authority either do too little or do too much. And that directly leads to a lot of volatility in the policy process, right? I mean, you can see the regulatory pendulum can swing, you know, from very lax all of a sudden to another extreme. Right? And in the book, I devoted you know, three chapters to explain how China regulates the big tech you know, in data, in antitrust, and labor. You see the striking similar pattern. Right? Before, they did very little, minimum, very light touch. And all of a sudden, after the crackdown, they s overnight, you know, they tighten all the regulations and, um, and, and try to do as much as possible. Right? I mean, but then, obviously, that leads to a very fragile outcome. By a very fragile outcome, I mean that you know, often very well-intentioned regulatory interventions can generate vast unintended consequences. Right? It's like you're taking a drug, but then the side effects have overtook the original problem you're trying to address. And, and it often takes a long time for the regulators to realize this problem. Right? So by the time they come back to reverse course, it's often too late and has resulted in irreparable damage. Right? And so this, I call it a dynamic pyramid model, um, can be used to, you know, for us to think more generally about all the policy challenges that China is facing today. Okay? Now let's start from the hierarchy. Okay? Thinking about what does the Chinese policy makers want from AI, and as the cover of the book shows, right, he's walking on high wire all the time because he needs to constantly balance different competing interests, right? The Chinese top policymakers obviously want China to be an AI superpower, and because AI is expected to bring enormous benefits to the Chinese economy. We just finished the two sessions of the National People's Congress where the new buzzword now is the new quality productive force, right? And AI is highlighted as one of those crucial technology that can power the industrialization of the Chinese economy and then can further upgrade, you know, boost and revitalize China's current second economy. Another big elephant in the room is that China has great ambition to compete with the US in AI capability, and now the gap is widening, particularly with ChatGPT and the US rounds of export restrictions of advanced NVIDIA chips to China, right? I mean, so from the Chinese government standpoint, they don't want, they have little incentive to impose very strict regulation, just like think about EU or you know, US. They don't want to hold back their own AI development because of their own law, right? Why would you put the stone over your own feet, right? Um, but on the other hand, an authoritarian government is inherently insecure about information control, right? I mean, that actually is the main motivation why the Chinese government have been so proactive 
in turning out all these AI legislations. And China was also the first country, the only country to have a license regime uh, for a generative AI, right? I mean, that was the main reason because they are worried that you know those AI generative output might interfere with public discourse, right? Th so the information control and content moderation is the major concern of the Chinese government. And if you look at all the Chinese AI legislation, they have very similar requirement of the so-called security assessment before you introduce public services. Uh, AI services to the public, right? We, we, and actually that security assessment requirement dates back to 2018, that particular piece of legislation um, the CAC introduced um, specifically targeted at those online services that could have public opinion mobilization capacity. So you see where the CAC, that Cyberspace Administration comes from. It is an agency in charge of uh, information control and censorship in China, right? So it's most concerned about public opinion. It doesn't want, it wants to ensure, uh, you know, political stability and, you know, public opinion does not interfere um, uh, by, by these AI services. And for the most part, they want to ensure political alignment of AI content, right? I mean, so you, ever since then, you see very consistent, um, uh, similar uh, requirement in the 2021 regulation on uh, recommendation algorithm, the 2022 regulation on deepfake, and now the 2023 regulation on generative AI. You see exactly the same requirement. And I would also say this is the most important requirement in this law, right? And if you talk to any of the entrepreneur, what do, what do they really care about is this, right? Because now if I'm Baidu, I am ByteDance, I introduce a new app, you know, a generative AI app uh, to, to the service, I need to get a clearance from CAC and obtain this license. This is truly what they care about. Okay? <coughs> However, I want to draw your attention to other aspects of Chinese AI law. Remember, our policymakers are walking on high wire. On the one hand, they do need to do what they need to do, right? I mean, that, that's the bottom line. They need to maintain information control. They need to ensure political alignment of AI content. But on the other hand, they do want to forge ahead with China's AI development. So how can they juggle that, right? So I particularly want to draw your attention to some of the specific provisions in China's generative AI law, um, where I think you know, these laws actually have very little protective value for its citizens, but rather they work like an industrial policy Right? So I call it the expressive power of the Chinese law. And actually, this expressive power law is a term coined by Richard McAdam, a professor from the University of Chicago, where he particularly highlighted two important functions of law people tend to overlook. One is the information function, and one is the coordination function. Right? So I'm today presenting in front of an audience who are probably not lawyers like what I usually talk to, right? Because as lawyers, we, t we, we think about law uh, as our general public. When we think about law, law is there to protect people, to exclude people from infringing other people's rights. I mean, law's purpose is to penalize, to sanction, right? It's so that you have this deterrent effect. So that's your general perception of law, right? It, but today, I'm not talking about any of those. I, and I'm saying that the Chinese AI law, in fact, have very little deterrence effect. It's mostly for information values and its coordination function. Okay, so I call it the expressive power, right? So, and, and in fact, these are the more important functions than, um, and, than the deterrent um, and, the, and the punishment function. Why do I think Chinese AI legislation have a lot of information value, okay? When we compare the finalized AI, uh, generative AI uh, measures, we call the interim measures published in uh, August last year, we saw that this law actually was significantly watered down compared with the previous version that was published uh, three months earlier. Okay? And um, it, it, um, it uh, reduced, uh, actually removed the requirements of some of the stringent, some of the very stringent requirements say, you know, if the AI output that is generated, the content generated, 
is not is deemed to uh, violate the content requirement, the firm will need to um, you know fine tune its model within the three months deadline. Okay, so this kind of requirement um, actually significantly watered out. And that came of a very big relief for industry, right? I mean, if I need to keep constantly refining and fine-tuning my model, tweaking my model every three months, which is very expensive, right? I mean, that's a huge compliance cost. And there was, in previous draft, they also have some requirements like you have to make sure the content generated is true and accurate, right? I mean, it isn't possible to comply with. And now they changed the laws that, you know, you make the best efforts to ensure, right? I mean, so, you know, query, what do you mean by best efforts? But you, you see they, they significantly water down those requirements. But most importantly, they significantly narrow the scope of application, right? So they clarify that this law only applies to those firms that are offering services to the public. So to the extent that you are, you know, training an AI model in, at the University of Hong Kong's AI lab, or you are only you know, selling your services to Google, to Microsoft, to Baidu, and to, to uh, Huawei, you're not subject to this law, right? So that's a very big carve out. And, and it's uh, warmly welcomed by a lot of the small and medium sized firms who have no capacity to deal with the CAC's licensing requirement, right? Because yes, you, if you are Baidu, you are ByteDance, you can afford that. You can hire a few lawyers full time just work on the licensing, <laughs> you know, uh, tr fill in all these requirements, long forms by the CAC in order to obtain a license, right? But if you are just an entrepreneur from the University of Hong Kong, you know, you don't even have a legal counsel on your <laughs> in your team, right? how are you going to deal with that? But fortunately, this law would not apply to them, right? I mean, so that's a huge relief for the industry. And by the way, the law, when it was um, the, sec the finalized version, when it was promulgated, there are seven agencies jointly in charge uh, of, um, you know, uh, 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 there's seven agencies' name <laughs> on the law. So, the seven, so there are six agencies that joined the legislative process after the first version was introduced, right? So some of these agencies, like the National Development Reform Commission, the Ministry of Science and Technology, the Ministry of Industry, uh, uh, Ministry of Industry Information Technology, I mean, these agencies, they are tasked with China's technological self-sufficiency initiative, right? So from their bureaucratic standpoint, they have no interest to take very drastic actions to regulate AI. Rather, what they want is for China to push ahead with AI development so that China can become competitive, can stay competitive with the United States. And you can see once these legis legislators were introduced in the process, the law was become very different from the version that was solely introduced by the CAC, right? So you see within the Chinese bureaucracy, there is actually informal checks and balance because the, each agencies have very different missions and objectives. And this pro-growth faction has appeared to prevail over the pro-regulation faction in being able to water down the law, right? Because victory conveys power, right? So for, for a lot of entrepreneurs, when they see this law, this is a very friendly, industry-friendly signal to the market that China now, within the bureaucracy, the pro-growth faction has prevailed, okay? China is decisively pointing towards development of AI rather than regulating this technology. And, and this is a very important policy signal that the, the industry desperately need. Because remember, before this, the tech sector had been through a very tough crackdown, which lasted for 18 months, starting from late 2020, right? And after, in the aftermath of the crackdown, investor sentiments are very <coughs> low and entrepreneurs' real spirits were also undermined, right? So at this point, they can't afford to hear any further bad news from the regulator. And this kind of reassurances from the regulator are actually very, very important. And I, some say, you know, would this really help China to really succeed? Was I, I'm not saying this is a sufficient condition, but this is a necessary condition, without which no one would want to invest in China's AI industry. Okay, the other important function of China's AI legislation is the coordination function. 
I specifically want to direct your attention to Article 5, Article 6, Article 15 of the Genitive AI measures. These very friendly <laughs> provisions were incorporated um, in the final draft, not in the first version. I mean, similarly, they were pushed by those pro-regulation, uh, pro-growth faction. Um, they were kind of like industrial policies. So this provision, you don't see that in other jurisdictions. And trying to coordinate um, the society, um, the different industry participants, and the different inputs into AI in order to forge ahead with AI development. Right? They want to coordinate the different regulators to regulate this technology. They want to coordinate the industry participants in the AI development ecosystem. Um, think about the university, um, the, um, the industry alliance associations, um, the farms, the local governments. They want everybody to, to work together. Right? Because if you think about AI development, of, very often it involves university uh, scientists, it involves the backing from the local government, it involves the industry associations, right? And the law also trying to encourage um, the coordination of data, data inputs, because data is an essential input into AI models. Now, China used to have a great advantage in a data uh, resources for AI. Right, particularly when you think about facial recognition technology. All these Chinese uh, leading AI firms they work very closely with the Chinese government, uh, sourcing data from the Chinese public security department. Um, and in fact, there's a, a lot of empirical studies showing that you know, this kind of public procurement of a private uh, AI, uh, uh, AI services actually was the main contributor, one of the important contributor to the development of China's facial recognition technology. And that's why China now has the best facial recognition technology. right? But when it comes to textual data, China has a big scarcity problem. right? First, there's very few Chinese language database to start with, not to mention that there are very few open source databases. Now, China's tech sector is very, very concentrated, and all the big tech giants, like particularly the duopolies that we are talking about, like the Tencent and Alibaba, right? I mean, they operate their own very close ecosystem, so they don't share data um, with outsiders, right? I mean, so there are very few open source databases, very few Chinese language databases, and, and that's a big problem for Chinese firms. So even Baidu, ByteDance, they openly admit that they use foreign database to train their model, right? So Biden said they have used uh, Wikipedia, used Reddit to train uh, the AI model. The problem is when you use the foreign databases, you run to alignment problem, right? Because the CAC is very strict about content moderation, but the data coming from the outside is not clean to start with. So these firms will actually need to spend more resources in fine-tuning their model and make sure about alignment, and that's very costly, right? So now the government is trying to encourage firms, both public and private firms, to work together to create data alliances to train those models, right? That immediately raised the question, isn't that IP infringement issues? But anyway, that's secondary. They all now want to create data alliance. They want to have abundant data resources to train. Right? Because they want to avoid a lot of the fine-tuning costs uh, later down the road. So you see the government is now explicitly coordinating data uh, resources uh, in China. And the government is also coordinating computing power resources, which is another major input into training AI models. Um, now, China is facing Chinese farm. This is the biggest bottleneck faced by Chinese AI firms these days, right? Because they can't access the most advanced AI chips from the United States. And now they, the US is now imposing, thinking about contemplating further restrictions on Chinese AI firms. And then that is widening the gap between the US and China AI power uh, capability. And uh, well, in response, China obviously have doubled down on um, trying to produce its own AI chips, but China has very minimum capacity in that regard, you know, because NVIDIA has almost 90% market share, right? So we can't really rely on that. And um, China is now trying to improve how we can more efficiently use a computing resources, given that it's so scarce at the moment, right? So you see in China, data center have proliferated all across the country. 
and the government is now calling for initiative to relocate those data centers to the western part of China, right? So there is a project called Eastern Data Western uh, Center, data center, because running those data center is very energy intensive, right? The training of the AI model and the deployment of the AI model consume a lot of electricity. So they want the data center to be located in the west where the utility prices are cheaper, right? And then, uh, although the, the data will, will be sourced uh, from the east, right? I mean, the Chinese government can afford that because they have this mass mobilization um, capability. And Chinese government is offering vouchers to uh, some of the smaller, medium-sized AI startups to train the AI models because now the bigger players like Alibaba, before, before they can potentially use Alibaba's cloud services, but now Alibaba has run into its own <laughs> computing power scarcity problem, right? So they no longer you know, continue with this kind of contractual relationship with the smaller players and the government is now trying to help them by offering uh, vouchers to use the government's data center. So basically giving them a discount to use those data centers. And, and the law explicitly encouraged that. Right? So basically you can see the law is trying to create kind of a focal point to empower everybody in China's AI ecosystem to forge ahead with AI development. The, the law also called for the coordination of standard setting because if you think about AI, um, standard setting is a very important component, component of the AI governance. And um, in the 5G era, China had great success because Huawei was a pioneer in 5G technology and Huawei was a standard setter for 5G. And once you are a standard setter, it has enormous commercial uh, you know, uh, benefits. So China also have ambition to be the rule setter of AI regulation. China also want to have a voice in AI, global AI regulation and governance. That's why you see China has been very active at the United Nations, trying to advocate for more growth in AI regulation. And lastly, I think one important thing that people tend to overlook is that having a national, this is not a national law, but it's, it's a law you know, promulgated by authorities from Beijing, right? It also helps coordinate local legislation because China has 31 provincial level provinces and each one of them have some sort of legislative cap capability, right? So having the, the national law out first will help guide the local regions in designing their own AI law. And in fact, before the generative AI measures came out, you know, the city of um, the, 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 Shen, is it the Shenzhen, um, Shenzhen and Shanghai already have introduced their own AI legislation. Okay? So what China is doing is perfectly, this AI, all these AI efforts that it's marshalling is perfectly consistent with the Zhuguo approach that it is currently advocating um, to uh, forge ahead with its own um, uh, uh, technological advancement in competition with the US. We call it a whole of society approach. Now, when you look at the US executive order introduced in October last year, it's actually, you can see very similar a mindset that the Biden administration, you know, in addition to imposing some minimal requirements of transparency and safety on its AI firms, is also trying to invigorate kind of like a whole of government approach to advance its own AI development. So you see, you know, the US government actually is not doing something very different from the Chinese government. They are trying to also, you know, uh, get all its federal agencies together. How do we streamline the immigration requirements for AI talents to, into the United States? How we better allocate funding for AI research, right? However, the US can never go gone that far as China because, you know, it's not just a government, right? It's now marshalling the entire resources, everything in a society to power AI development. And that was explicit written into the law, right? So what are the consequences? Let me bring back the study in my book, right? If you think about, so what China, so we have been through one cycle re legis uh, regulation of China's consumer tech businesses. And if we think about AI as the next cycle, right? And we are only at the very beginning of this next cycle and it's useful to look look back to see how China used to regulate consumer tech businesses when it was very supportive of this technology, right? So that helped us to predict what's going to happen in the future. So this is a very hierarchical regulatory structure involving four major players in China's uh, regulatory system. 
And at the beginning, as you may recall, now we have the AI Plus initiative. Back then, in 2015, we had the Internet Plus initiative. And actually, that was a turn coined by Pony Ma from Tencent. Um, he was the one who proposed this, and then later the state council endorsed it. And so that was really helpful to the, all the internet businesses. So despite the fact that you see problems started to emerge, tension has started to accumulate, um, but the regulators, remember, they are held in the upper accountability, accountability uh, manner, so they respond to the policy win from the top, and they took a very lax stance in regulating um, the, the platforms, right? So this, the consequence is that the information transmission from the regulator to the top policymakers was very slow. So the top policymakers didn't really know, you know, there's so many things actually having going on with the platform. And then, um, and, and, and then, so this is what I'm going to predict with China's AI uh, regulation in the near future, is that we are likely to see very similar dynamic with AI law, given now the whole policy environment is so friendly to the AI industry, that agencies will take a very lax stance, okay? Now, Angela, how do you know that they're taking a very lax stance? Look at what they do, not what they say, okay? Have you seen any of the Chinese data authority march into Baidu's office for investigating the data violation? Have you seen any of the IP you know, departments charge any of the Chinese AI firm for uh, using the, uh, data for IP infringement? Well, you ask yourself these questions, right? Look at the actions rather than what's on the paper. And what's more, you see some of the cases uh, recently delivered by the Chinese court are very industry friendly. So in uh, December, uh, in, in November last year, the China's internet court in Beijing uh, delivered a very controversial ruling actually involving this AI generative image. Um, so the, the, the lady on the left side, the farthest left, um, was the final uh, AI generative image, but this was the process. Right? This, so, so basically the user put in a lot of prompts and gradually, eventually, um, he reached this product. And the court decided to give copyright protection to this AI generative image. And that's a very controversial decision because in the US, um, and, and that actually is a controversial decision. First, China is the first jurisdiction in the world to give copyright protection to AI generative output, okay? And the Chinese approach also deviate from what you see in the United States, where there's been a lot of applications trying to you know, persuade the courts and the, 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 the copyright office to regulate, uh, recognize uh, AI generative output, but courts have consistently, and the agencies, the US Copyright Office consistently deny doing that, despite the fact that the user put in tremendous efforts in, um, in generative, uh, generating these images, right? And the Chinese court, one of the major reasons of the Chinese court in doing that is because, look, I mean, if we don't recognize, don't give some sort of protection to AI generative uh, 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 output, then this will discourage people from using AI tools. And in turn, that will uh, hurt the industry's competitiveness, right? So now, since we get copyright protection, that will incentivize more and more Chinese people to use AI services, and that will help boost the industry. So you see the policy, the, the policy mindsets have already influenced and affected the judicial ruling and uh, make the court at least feel more confident in their own decisions. Now in this op-ed that I published um, in December, I challenge the court's decision. I was very critical of the court's decision because I think in the short term, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's a good um, argument, but in the longer term, you might run into a bigger problem, right? I mean, think about it. If you want to train a very powerful AI model, you need human generative um, uh, data. You can't rely on AI generated data, right? I mean, because there have been abundant studies showing if you feed the machine with AI data, the machine will become stupid, right? The cause they cause dementia uh, or, or even cause the uh, collapse of the AI model, right? I mean, so you, you still need to feed them with human generative uh, uh, um, data, but the more you encourage people to use AI tools, 
then the human will be less incentivized in producing it, right? I mean, why would I spend so much effort painting something when you can do it in two seconds? And, and, and so eventually we will run into a data scarcity problem. We already have a data scarcity problem, right? I mean, so there is a delicate balance that uh, we need to make uh, when we think about how we incentivize um, uh, people to use uh, its AI services. You don't need to necessarily incentivize them to do that through copyright law, right? I mean, think about all, all these potential repercussions that you have. And if you're interested in this, I have another paper um, uh, on this too. Um, so, to some, am I running out of time? Do I talk a lot already? So, so how, how about? If you don't mind, we go on to two. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Okay, I will wrap up now. Um, um, and so, to synthesize what we have uh, talked about so far, we see, you know, what is the implication of this kind of different uh, uh, legislative uh, strategy, uh, legal strategy by different countries, right? I mean, in the U.S., it's a very decentralized uh, 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 regulatory regime, right? I mean, so, uh, yes, at the federal and the state level, um, there's quite light, light touch regulation, but nonetheless, they have a very strong point as far, right? I mean, so that is, is putting costs and, and a lot of compliance burdens on the firms. In the EU, yes, they don't have a licensing regime. However, they are imposing a lot of the pre-launch requirements on a lot of AI services. Firms do need to improve compliance, and that's a lot of cost. And in Europe, you do need to take compliance very seriously because these regulators, they will find you. They will investigate. They will enforce. Right? They, they mean serious businesses. Now, in China, we have a seemingly a quite strict license regime. However, my prediction is that when it comes to everything else, okay, everything else, China is going to take a very lax stand in uh, enforcing its law against the big uh, AI firms. Against the big AI firms, remember. I mean, if you're individuals, you know, you're doing deep fake, you're likely to be prosecuted very quickly. But I'm talking about the big firms, okay? So this give, in, in effect, this gives the Chinese firms a slight competitive advantage, right? Because you don't need to worry so much about the copyright infringement, you know, data violation issues, right? I mean, despite the fact that we have a very strict data law, the personal information protection law, it's very unlikely they will they will apply that directly to you and find you, you know, impose a very astronomical fine. But rather, agencies are expected to take a very consensual approach, very friendly approach in, um, in dealing with this firm. So in a way that, you know, give them a very friendly environment. But this very strategically leaning approach is also, can also lead to problems, right? I mean, in fact, China is now the country that is ranked as the most optimistic about AI technology, and um, and some of the policy analysts uh, have predict, you know, have actually cautioned that this could lead to AI-induced accidents and AI, you know, induced uh, catastrophe in China because because of uh, all sorts of reasons. Right? I mean, it, it's very weak institutional environment to start with, and currently there's very lax regulatory control when it comes to AI services. Okay, so remember. We go back to the last cycle, look at how China regulate the consumer tech businesses. And initially, you know, all these problems were very, you know, uh, uh, they, they, they don't do much with regulating. But once the regulators reported the matters to the top, remember, the top can mobilize a massive enforcement campaign just like what it did between 2020 and 2022 and took a very aggressive stance in regulating this sector, right? I mean, China can afford to do that. The, the problem is the outcome, right? By the time you took drastic actions to deal with this, we go back to my dynamic pyramid model, is that it tends to lead to a very fragile outcome because oftentimes, when you reach that point, which is so severe, the problem is so severe, right? It tends to generate a lot of side effects, a lot of unintended consequences. And because of the information lag is very long, right? I mean, so when you want to reverse costs, it can generate huge market backlash. And this is exactly what we saw with China's tech crackdown um, and uh, where, you know, 
the biggest Chinese tech firms lost trillions of dollars um, as a result uh, of, of, of the crackdown. And it hasn't really dealt, where, you know, really solved the competition problem in China's consumer tech businesses. Right? So we have to bear, bear the whole cycle in mind when you think about um, China's AI legislation. And that's bring me to the last slide of today's presentation. It, that's why I think international cooperation is very important, right? I mean, yes, they can't do too much. Right? They, they, they can, yes, they can probably do very little anyway. Um, but still, having international cooperation, you, you, you break the Chinese system. Because before, you're thinking about the system. My dynamic period model is in an enclosed system. But now when you introduce international cooperation, you bring new players to the scenes. And that helps facilitate information exchange to start with. Right? I mean, so I think that's important. And however, the current geopolitical environment is not conducive to uh, international cooperation. As you recall, last November, when UK was, was um, planning the, the, the UK safety summit on AI, and um, the biggest debate in that summit is not about AI safety. It's about whether China should be invited. Okay? And then when China, when China received the invitation, um, the former, pro vice, uh, former Prime Minister Liz Truss actually wrote an opinion to say, you know, that um, invitation should be rescinded immediately. Right? And then some suggested, like, maybe China can only attend half of the program. And, and China said, if that's the case, I'm not coming. <laughs> right? I mean, so, you know, so it's this current um, Sino US tech rivalry and the overall hostility towards China is now making it very difficult for us to achieve any meaningful form of international cooperation. So if you're interested in learning more, you can follow my personal website where I have a lot of stuff going on um, because AI is my new gig. Um, and I will devote almost all my um, academic attention to AI in the next couple of years, like a lot of AI entrepreneurs. And um, so uh, follow me. And, um, and I look forward to your feedback today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Angela. You know, our colleague, Ma Yi, um, who is now the head of uh, Data Institute at Hong Kong University, uh, has told me, you know, because he knows that I'm running this institute, and he strongly encouraged me to spend a lot more time to think about AI policies, because he is actually warning me how fast he and his teams and other people are developing new technologies in AI. And he shared the concerns, like what you had, that you know, the policymakers are way behind and fall, falling more behind than uh, before. Uh, so in fact, in November, uh, in our Asia Global Dialogue, hopefully uh, you'll come to join us, uh, we're going to have a session on AI. And we're going to bring scientists uh, to talk to the policymakers and policy researchers to make sure that each side is well informed uh, to really uh, sort of facilitate you know, policy discussions and really coming up uh, with actual policies rather than, as you said, you know, talking at a very high level. But anyhow, you know, this book is a good start uh, for that dialogue uh, between scientists and policymakers. Thank you so much for writing this book. Um, I should have invited you to bring a lot of copies to sell here, but you know, I've been traveling a lot and sorry for not reminding you. It's all out, uh, but you can go to Amazon and pre-order the next edition of it. Yeah, Amazon still has some copies. Okay, the physical copies in, his, in her office were sold out. So, um, but it's on Amazon US. You, it can ship to Hong Kong. Yes. <laughs> so order it before it run run uh, run out of stock again. Yeah. Yeah. So go to Amazon right now. Make sure you pre-order or order. Uh, you ship to Hong Kong. Thank you so much, Angela, for the wonderful and insightful discussion today.